for a reporter confession. The business found on page 56. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Most merciful God, we confess that we are in bondage to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God in his mercy has given his Son to die for us and for his sake forgives us all our sins. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ and by his authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs>
The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. reading from Jeremiah, the 31st chapter. Thus says the Lord, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant that they broke though I was their husband, declares the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And no longer shall each one teach his neighbor and each his brother, saying, Know the Lord. For they shall out all know me, for the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. <laughs>
Hebrews, the fifth chapter. For every high priest chosen from among men is appointed to act on behalf of men in relation to God, to offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. He can deal gently with the ignorant and wayward, since he himself is beset with weakness. Because of this, he is obligated to offer sacrifice for his own sins, just as he does for those of the people. And no one takes this honor for himself, but only when called by God, just as Aaron was. So also Christ did not exalt himself to be made a high priest, but was appointed by him who said to him, You are my son, today I have begotten you. As he says also in another place, You are a priest forever, after the order of Melchizedek. In the days of flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverence. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation to all who obey him. Being designated by God a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. sons of Zebedee came up to Jesus and said to him, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. And he said to them, What do you want me to do for you? And they said to him, Grant us to sit, one at your right hand and one at your left, in your glory. Jesus said to them, You do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink? or to be baptized with the baptism with which I am baptized? And they said to him, We are able. And Jesus said to them, The cup that I drink, you will drink, and with the baptism, the baptism with which I am baptized, you will be baptized. But to sit at my right hand or at my left is not mine to grant, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared. And when the ten heard it, they began to be indignant at James and John. And Jesus called them to him and said to them, You know that those who are considered rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. But it shall not be so among you. But whoever would be great among you must be your servant, and whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Please be seated. At this time, we invite any young children with us this morning. Um, anyone up, any children up through the fifth grade, we do have children's church. Um, led by Josh. I don't know if we have any children with us in the room. Okay, well, um, in case we don't, uh, we do offer that um, for now. I did not announce to you earlier that um, all Sunday school for all ages, including our children, is coming back April 18th. So Children's Sunday School is coming back to us in person on Sunday, April 18th. Um, our next Children's Church after today 
will be the Sunday after, the second Sunday of Easter will be April 11th. Uh, one more children's church after today. But of course, we are glad that we were able to offer some Christian ed time um, while we we're getting ready for children's Sunday school. Let us pray. Lord, let the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O oh Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. We all might use debit cards uh, so often now when we're out and about buying things that if we don't get to have coins in our hand, change in our pockets as much as we used to, but coins can be fun. Collecting coins can be fun. And I remember as a child, it, I thought it was really cool how they came out with the new quarters. That uh, was one for each of the 50 states. On the back side of the quarter, you had one for each of the 50 states that was going to come out and be unrolled um, over the course of a few years. Well, the year that all started with the new quarters, um, my parents gave my brother and I a coin map for Christmas. And so we were all excited to fill up, you know, put another coin in the slot by each of the 50 states. And later on that year, my dad, as he often would, would come home from work and he would say, hey, Craig and Cassie, I've got, I've got a new quarter. Maybe you guys don't have this one yet. And we looked at the back of it and we checked, yeah, I don't have that state yet. Neither one of us had it. So it was very desirable for both of our maps. And so to be fair, to be fair, my dad said, well, we'll flip for it. You know, heads it's yours, tails it's yours. So I was, you know, really eager to get that coin for myself. And so I borrowed that, that quarter and I went back to my room. And I thought, well, I know I just have either heads or tails, but I want to see how this quarter, how often it lands on heads or tails. And then I'll, then I'll be able to figure out for real, what you know, how it's going to end up for me. So I went back in my room and I'm flipping the coin maybe a dozen or so times and marking down on the sheet how it landed, heads or tails. And then I went back out and after I was sure I knew how it was going to land, went back out and gave the quarter back to my dad and he did his coin toss for us. And I called tails and my brother called heads. Of course, it landed on heads. I didn't get it. I was so bummed. In case you're worried, I did end up taking statistics in high school and got at least a B, so we're fine. We're fine that way. But my dad was just being fair with us. Well, we've got these two brothers who are coming to Jesus in our gospel text this morning with a request. And they're wanting to be the top two guys in their in seats of honor with Jesus. And Jesus, as he responds to them, he's not trying to give them the fair answer. He's not going to say, heads your first and tails your second. He doesn't have that approach with them. It's not about being fair. When they, when James and John give their request to Jesus, Jesus tells them, you don't know what you're asking. You really don't know what you're asking. Jesus is not here to enact an earthly kingdom so that he can have his right hand and left hand men to, to also have this incredible power and authority on the earth alone. Jesus is going to suffer and give himself up for a heavenly kingdom that Jesus was enacting. And he says to them, these disciples, you're trusting me, you're following me, you're following me, but I want you to know what following me, what that really is going to entail for you. So let's walk through this conversation uh, that these two brothers have in our gospel text. So we'll start out at the beginning of our passage um, at verse 35. It 
So James and John, these two brothers, sons of Zebedee, and they came up to Jesus and they said to him, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. Isn't that kind of interesting? They go up to Jesus with no context about what it is they're asking of him. We just want you to do whatever we ask you, Jesus. A little bit demanding there on the outset. And so Jesus, I'm sure he has braced himself. He said to them, well, what do you want me to do for you? And he, and then they said to him, bring us to sit one at your right hand and one at your left in your glory. So again, they're looking for that glory in the earthly kingdom. They're looking for earthly glory. They don't yet have a grasp of what that heavenly glory is really all about. And then continuing on, I mean, verses 38 to 40, verses 38 to 40, Jesus said to them, you do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink or to be <coughs> baptized with the baptism with which I am baptized? And they said to him, we're able. And Jesus said to them, the cup that I drink, you will drink. And with the baptism with which I am baptized, you will be baptized. But to sit at my right hand or at my left is not mine to grant, it is the Father's. But it is for those for whom it has been prepared. So what is this cup? What is this baptism that Jesus is talking about? These are both actually figures of speech that Jesus is talking about the cross. He's talking about how he is making his way to the cross. He's going to talk with them about his suffering and what his followers, his disciples, are expected to also endure if they really follow him through. If we think about that cup, that cup that Jesus is talking about, it hearkens to the Garden of Gethsemane. Um, in Matthew chapter 26, verse 39, Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane, and he fell on his face and he prayed to the Father, My Father, if it be possible, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will, this cup and all that he would be drinking in, that is the suffering that he would endure in his crucifixion. And this baptism that Jesus is talking about with James and John, it's more of a, a, figurative, a figurative way of, of talking to the disciples about how following Jesus will be like submerging yourself and suffering, submerging ourselves in suffering. So there is this intensity here with what Jesus is saying, but do you really know what you're asking? Do you really know what you're getting yourself into? And for a deeper understanding for, for this exchange between James and John and Jesus and what Jesus tells his disciples, we can go back um, a few verses and even a few chapters in Mark um, because here right before we get to this passage in verses 32 through 34 um, Jesus is on the road with his disciples and he says to them see we are going to Jerusalem so at this point he is clearly making his way to where that cross will be and what that event will be so for the third time in Mark, and the couple of verses right before our passage today, for the third time in Mark, Jesus is preparing us for the cross. He's telling us exactly what is going to happen to him and what that will be for us. And in each mention, those three times, Jesus kind of builds on it and reveals a little bit more about what his crucifixion and his resurrection will be like. So in Mark, Chapter 8, going back a little bit, Jesus speaks plainly, you know, for the first time um, about what his crucifixion and resurrection will be like. 
In Mark chapter 8, he says, Jesus says, or Mark says, um, he began to teach them, Jesus began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed, and after three days rise again. And then a little bit later on in Mark chapter 9, Jesus builds on that a little bit, and this time he tells them he's going to be betrayed. Jesus says, the Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men, and they will kill him. And when he is killed, after three days, he will rise. And then taking it back one more time, a little bit before our passage today, verse 32 of chapter 10, Jesus says, they will mock him and spit on him and flog him and kill him. And after three days, he will rise. That's the kind of suffering that Jesus is going to endure. So after this exchange with James and John that Jesus has with them at the beginning of our passage today, the rest of our passage, verses 41 and 45, Jesus is talking with the other ten disciples. And when they overhear James and John asking Jesus, it's kind of a question. Can we be your two top guys? They were indignant with them. Is it really guys you're going to ask that? And Jesus says to them, no, let's just lay it all out there. This is what following me is all about. It's all about serving. Following Jesus is all about serving. So walking through those next verses in our passage, We'll start again at verse 42. Verse 42, Jesus called them, the other disciples, to him and said to them, You know that those who are considered rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. But it shall not be so among you. But whoever would be great among you must be your servant, and whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. You want to be great? You want to be great? If you follow me, you won't get that kind of earthly greatness with power and authority. But Jesus says, if you follow me, greatness is achieved through serving. Greatness is going to be achieved through serving. It's a whole different kind of of greatness that is so much more beautiful and, and fulfilling. Greatness will be achieved through serving. And the good news is, is that Jesus doesn't just call us into this life of serving. That will include suffering. Jesus does that for us. That's the good news for us in verse 45. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus came to serve us. His life, Jesus' life, is a ransom for us. He paid the price for us when he was crucified. His death was the payment for all of our sins, all of our sins that were going to send us into eternal death. Jesus took those upon himself on the cross. And he was victorious. He rose again. He conquered death. He conquered the power of sin and the power of the devil. Jesus served us. Jesus came to serve us, and he has called us to serve like he does. And serving Jesus, or serving like Jesus serves, is not done because we need to earn anything. We need to earn our salvation. It's because of what Christ has done for us. We serve not to earn anything, but because of what Christ has done for us. And how are we going to serve? How we have that ability to serve? We'll be guided by God. We'll be empowered by the Holy Spirit. We'll be using our God-given gifts to serve in His name. A lot of times we talk about 
finding our identity in Christ. Thinking about who we are as individuals, as people, who we are, what is our identity, and then how do we find that as Christians? How do we find our identity, how defining who we are in Christ? Who am I because I am a disciple of Jesus? And in this gospel passage, finding our identity in Christ means serving like Jesus serves. Serving in Christ's name becomes a part of who we are. Not just a part, but just our whole selves. Serving comes from our heart, comes from deep within us. It's our purpose for how we move about in the world and how we act and treat others in our relationships and what we value, what we do, the things we say, the things that we do, that heart of service comes from God. We find our identity in Christ by serving like Jesus serves. That's what Mark wants us to know today in this passage. Think about what kind of people that you know who serve from the heart. Think about someone you know and love that just, just exudes this heart of service. And it's just who they are. And it's just what they do. And they don't make a big fuss over it. They don't want a lot of attention over it even. But it's just who they are. They're, they're born to serve and they love doing it. Think about the kind of people, someone you might know, you're thinking about right now, a specific person. Or think about any kinds of people, groups of people that you know that that have served in the name of Christ. I'm thinking about grandparents. I'm thinking about grandparents who serve, who have that heart to serve, how they teach their children, their grandchildren to do the same. Maybe sometimes serving like Jesus serves is a lot like serving like our grandparents have served. Maybe your grandparents have made a lot of sacrifices. Maybe your, your grandma has made a lot of sacrifices for your family. Maybe your grandpa has made a lot of sacrifices for his country. Maybe your grandparents have just done a lot of little things over the course of their life, or over the course of your life, that all those little things that they've done just kind of add up to this whole identity in Christ of serving like Jesus serves. I mean, the food alone that our grandmas serve, the food alone, you think about how good it tastes and, and the recipes they have, and even the snacks they had in their pantry that you just always kind of go to, and there's something special about having that one brand of chips or crackers at your grandma's house. If you don't have a grandma, maybe it's an aunt or a grandpa, maybe it's an uncle or or a relative or a friend or a neighbor that has been that person for you to demonstrate what a heart of serving really looks like. Our grandparents, a lot of them know exactly what it means to serve like Jesus serves. What made me think about grandparents was my own grandmother. I call her Grammy. And I discovered when I was a teenager how my Grammy really does have this, this beautiful heart for service. And I discovered it when I sat down at breakfast at her house, and she had buttered my toast. I don't know why that just really spoke to me that morning, but it did. Maybe serving is like buttering someone's toast for them. I had spent the night at my, at my grandparents' house like my cousins and my brother often would, and, and sometimes, you know, on our own. And so this time it was just me at my grandparents' house and woke up the next morning and, and my Grammy had made us breakfast, you know, something simple, probably just eggs and bacon and toast. And, and so I'm sitting down to eat and I, I see that, you know, my toast on my plate is already buttered. And I could, could think back about the night before where when my dad dropped me off and he would joke and tease a lot about how how spoiled the grandparents, the grandkids were 
by their grandparents and all the things that that my Grammy you know had done for for my brother and me and my cousins that you know they just never did for for my dad and, and my uncle when they were growing up just how spoiled we were and so after I had seen that my that my toast was buttered at breakfast went back home and and told my dad all about it like I was bragging to him about something Grammy buttered my toast this morning and he just looked at me and laughed and he said Sweetheart, I hate to break it to you, but she's been buttering my toast for years. <laughs> I tell my Grammy that story, and we still laugh about it, and she laughs about it because, well, that's just what she does. Just who she is. All these little things. Buttering your own toast is very easy to do, but she just wanted to do that for someone that she loved. And it came out of that heart of service. Sometimes serving is just buttering someone's toast. As simple as that might seem, all those little things that add up. Sometimes, like Jesus clearly tells us in the gospel time and time again, serving others involves real suffering. And anything along that spectrum, you know, it's, just, it's all about our finding our identity in Christ by serving like Jesus serves us. So a call for each of us this morning, as it would be any Sunday, is how will we serve in the name of Christ? How is that going to be our identity? How we move about in the world like because of who we are in Christ? How will we serve in the name of Christ? How are we going to give of ourselves self-sacrificially to serve? How are we going to serve at work? How will we serve at work in the name of Christ? Maybe we're the ones to get there early and, and start the coffee pot. And don't look for bragging rights afterwards. Uh, maybe we're the ones at work that we're willing to swap shifts for someone else when they, when they need someone to, to back them up. Or maybe it's being a listening ear for our coworkers. When they're just having a rough morning, you'll be the one, we'll be the one to listen, to be there to hear them out. How will we serve our families in the name of Christ? Maybe after a meal, we'll, we'll just volunteer to clear the table when normally it's someone else's chore. There's all kinds of chores that we can do around the house to help each other out. Maybe we'll treat our family to something special, something fun, or just a nice little gift to let them know how much we love them. How will we serve? How will we serve our friends and our neighbors? A lot of folks throughout this whole COVID ordeal have realized how, how truly isolating it's been. And to call their friends or FaceTime or, or even have a Zoom night, you know, with, with all your friends together with your neighbors, there's all kinds of ways that people have, have served in the name of Christ to be there for their friends and their neighbors. And then of course, how will we serve in our church? How will we serve in the name of Christ, being a part of the life of our congregation here at St. Peter's? There are so many ways, so many ways that we can serve. We have so many gifts and talents. We have time. We have time to make it. To serve here in our congregation. We, we are the church. It's not just a place you go to. It's, it's a living, breathing body of Christ. And all of us are needed for it. All of these things that we do together as a congregation, in order for these things to happen in the way that we'd like them to so that we can bless our community, it takes us, it takes people to put those things together, to be here, to plan for it, to be a part of the, the committee meetings that sometimes go on too long, but we need them anyway, to take care of all these things. There's so many different behind the scenes things that all kinds of willing folks will do, that it makes a big difference, and it's so needed. How will we have a heart to serve like Jesus has done for us? Let's pray this week about how we might really do that. And not because we need to earn our salvation, Jesus is taking care of that through faith in him, He's done the work for us, but it's this 
motivation of finding our identity in Christ. It's who we are as Christians, as followers of Christ. We'll serve like Jesus serves because of his great love for us, because we're empowered by God to go and do. Let us pray. We thank you, Lord, for serving us in this amazing and merciful way that you have. We ask that you would guide us to serve you, to serve in your name, to make serving be at the heart of who we are and what we do. We pray, Lord, that Anything that we do for you, that it truly is for you, that it is for your glory and not ours. We pray in Jesus' name. explanation to the second article of the Apostles' Creed. I believe that Jesus Christ, true God, begotten of the Father from eternity, and also true man, born of the Virgin Mary, is my Lord. He has redeemed me, of a lost and condemned creature, and has freed me from sin, death, and the power of the devil not with silver and gold, but with his holy and precious blood and his innocent suffering and death. He has done all this in order that I might be his own, live under him in his kingdom, and serve him in everlasting righteousness, innocence, and blessedness, even as he is risen from the dead and lives and reigns for all eternity. This is most certainly true. Let us pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Heavenly Father, through the teachings of your Son, Je of your Son Jesus, we know that he did not come to this world to be served, but to serve. Help us discern the needs of others 
so we may also serve as he did. We humbly pray for your guidance as we seek to serve those who are in need. Lord, in your mercy, Lord, we are our prayer. Father of all creation, it is through your Son, Jesus Christ, that we are made new again. Let us rejoice and celebrate all that we have in you. The earth is also renewed in its spring, just as we are renewed through faith in you. Let us sing your praises as we relish all the reminders of new growth on the earth. Lord, in your mercy, we are our prayer. Almighty God, we pray for the wisdom and strength of our leaders in our churches, communities, government, and in our world. May they seek to understand your way and be considerate of one another in all matters. We also pray for those in the military who are upholding our freedom. Watch over them, protect them, and bring them home safely. And we pray, Lord, for all of the ways that we have been divided as a country, that you would bring your peace. And for all those who have been experiencing acts of hatred, that they would know your love. Lord, in your mercy, we are our prayer. Merciful Father, we know we can come to you for comfort when we have fallen ill, but let us not forget to praise you in all health matters. We pray that you make whole what needs to be mended or cured, whether it be in our body, mind, or our spirit. We lift up to you all those who are suffering in any way. We pray especially for Ed and Patty, Kelly, Barbara, Kim, Christy, Albert, Sandra, Elissa, Claire, for the family and loved ones of Sandra, for the family and loved ones of Wally. We pray for safe travels and rest for Pastor Bill. We pray for all those we now name to you on our hearts. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Into your hands, O oh Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. May the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you always. And also with you. Let us share the peace.
thanksgiving, what you have first given us, our selves, our time, and our possessions, signs of your precious love. Receive them for the sake of him who offered himself for us, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.
Christ given for you. Body of Christ given for you. Body of Christ given for you. The blood of Christ shed for you. The body of Christ given for you.
Christ. May the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. Thanks be to God.